poked feebly at balls he formerly would have smashed out of the ballpark. Sorrowfully, the Sultan of Swat realized that the time had come to quit. It was a relief to drop the Braves' uniform on the bench, for in his heart, Babe Ruth had never stopped being a Yankee. Babe Ruth was 40 years old when he retired from baseball in 1935 after a career that started in Boston and ended here. And a salary that final year? $35,000. On opening day, the Babe even hit a home run. But by the end of the season, he said goodbye to baseball forever. The last uniform he wore said Braves. Boston Braves. This is Jim Britt bringing you the story of the Braves family direct from the wigwam in Boston. Car giveaways and fan appreciation day, two things that were standard fare in the days of the Braves. This was a team that called their fans family. This then is the Braves family. And believed in making their fans feel good about a visit to the wigwam. The owners of the Braves decided to show their gratitude to tribal fans by giving away a Packard Deluxe sedan to a lucky ticket holder. Over the years, the Braves were known by various names. The Red Caps, the Red Stockings, the Doves, the Rustlers. But their identity as Braves, very politically incorrect by today's standards, was perfectly acceptable in the 1920s. Until the 1930s, their home ballpark near Boston University was the largest major league field in the country. A box seat cost two bucks. A grandstand, one dollar. And a bleacher seat, only 50 cents. No wonder the fans couldn't wait until opening day. I guess it must have been in 1927 was the first time that I went to a ball game. We used to see the Braves, and we used to go up that big ramp up to the to the grandstand, and that was the greatest thing in the world, walking up the ramp and looking out in the field and watching the players See, practice. It was just, just one that couldn't wait I to get in. I liked the Braves far better than the Red Sox. Yes, I did too. Yeah, they were, uh, somehow or other, they, uh, they had a, a, a different feeling at that ballpark. There was a warmer feeling. At Fenway Park, you were just sitting there and you weren't part of the game somehow or other, but at Braves, you got right into it and to, <laughs> Uh, some or other, the ball players would look up to you and wave to you, even though they didn't know you from a hole in the wall. Here, Bob at Wright and Tommy Holmes give a few tips to some Braves of the future. Neither of these stars was ever too busy to give helpful hints to boys. More than 1,278,000 members of the family saw their favorites at the wigwam. Oh, I always had a great feeling. I just felt I was at home. <laughs> You know, uh, even for the ushers were friendly, the, the security there, uh, they just, everybody was so solicitous of our well-being. You walked in and you sort of had the place to yourself, and we would get there early and we would walk all around the park. The Braves dugout was on third base, and we would sit in a box seat and talk to the players. I remember the very first game I went to, and it, uh, the field itself was just, it took me by eye, it was so, so huge. And the game in itself was just something that I just didn't believe, you know, maybe an instant fan. Well, my father saw that I was quite interested into the, uh, into the Boston Braves, he immediately went to, uh, picked up a, uh, registered me as a Nuthole Gang member. I think it cost him a dollar for the card for the, for the whole year. And what the Braves used to do to a, used to let us young fellows into the left field pavilion because they never used the left field pavilion anyways, and that's where we used to go and watch the ball games, and we were allowed into the games for free as long as we had that card. More than thirty thousand saw ten-year-old Lewis Cohen of the South End Boys Club present a hand-carved plaque to Billy Southworth. Addisee Fox Allen belonged to the class of 42 at the Jeremiah E. Burke School for Girls. She was a die-hard Braves fan who says that the Braves were in her destiny. We had a class prophecy, and we all contributed to this, but some of them said, you know, as they looked into the crystal ball, they saw there was Addisee Fox, the first woman sports announcer. And when I think back now, I laugh. A medical technician at Harvard Medical School 
Addison attended as many Braves games as she could. Her favorite player, Tommy Holmes. This is Tommy Holmes, longtime Braves favorite. At every game, he and his teammates would look up for Addison and for Lolly Hopkins, the lady with the Tootsie Rolls. Lolly would come armed with Tootsie Rolls and uh, would throw them out to the visiting teams. The the uh, local team she would give during batting practice, and the visiting team she would throw them out in between, you know, when as they were approaching the bench coming in off the field. Well, Lolly Hopkins was a great fan of the Braves, and she was there at every game with her megaphone, and whenever Tommy Holmes, one of the other ball players, would get a hit or something, she would yell it out, and naturally she'd have the backing of all the other fans behind her, and many of the ball players just would smile back or wave back to Lolly and the fans. It, it was. As we always said, it seems though the Braves and the, and, the, and the fans were much closer to, you know, it was like a family. I, you know, uh, felt this kinship to her and never, uh, never questioned uh, the fact that these women were going out to ball games and, and so forth, unescorted or uh, being subject to criticism or talk. In fact, it was quite the opposite. During a morning practice session in 1947, Tommy Holmes presented Lolly Hopkins an appreciation gift. The players didn't want any fanfare. They, in a quiet sort of way, merely wanted to let Lolly know how deeply they appreciated her loyal support. I met all of the prominent sports writers, and they all called me Young Hemi called my dad Hemi. When Jack Hamilton went to watch the Braves, he sat in the press box with his dad, Billy Hamilton, who was the sports editor at the Herald Traveler. I had entree to the garden, to the arena, to every place, because I'd just show up, oh, this is Hammy's kid. Thank you. Walk in, I'd take a pal with me. That that the kids used that to fight to great. come with me. Another was Nanny Fernandez's thriller against Brooklyn. When his perfect stop and throw By the time he was a teenager, Hammy's kid got a job as a scorekeeper at Braves Field. But more than a few times, the fan in him got the better of his attention. And what showed up on the manual scoreboard was proof of that. I had to watch the umpire, and I'd do it. And if I was wrong, there would be a, a buzz. In the meantime, I'm so interested in watching them and saying, come on. I forget to put up the names of the teams that are coming, so I get a call. Hey, get on the ball, put the teams up that are coming. So, Nick, uh, rather, uh, what's his name, the cartoonist for the Globe, Gene Mack, the next day had a little bit in his cartoon. The scoreboard boy put two new teams into the league. Washland and Clevington. Everybody loved the Braves, and, and that was the year that the Red Sox lost the playoff to, yeah. to Cleveland Indians. Uh, they, they would have been a, a Boston uh, World yeah. Series, but they lost the playoff that game that day. And uh, the, the Braves uh, just weren't good enough to beat the Indians. They had Spahn and Sane, but uh, the Indians were a little bit better. We had people, uh, ball players like uh, Alvin Dark and Eddie Stanky and Bob Elliott and Tommy Holmes, Earl Torgerson. They all just got together and just had a terrific year. It was just disappointing that they lost the World Series, but just nevertheless, they did make the win the pennant and they did get into the World Series, and that was uh, quite a thrill. The Whites included Billy Southworth. Johnny Cooney, Ernie White, Phil Macy. Although 1948 didn't bring Boston a city series, the Red Sox also lost in the playoffs. But the Braves did bring a closeness to their fans that was unusual in the 40s and is long gone by the 90s. By 1953, Boston could no longer support two major leagues, and so the Braves were sold to Milwaukee. 1953, it was, it was just real empty there. The grass was growing, the grass was so high, and it just it looked like a vacant, uh, someone just, you know, just packed up and left. And 
It's so sad to, every time I go there and see that the Braves have moved because that was my youth there. And I remember many a days just uh, standing uh, on Babcock Street waiting for the ball players to come in to get their autographs. As a parting thought to you young ball players, if you will play good heads up baseball and develop the four fundamentals, which are to be able to run, throw, field, and hit, you will help yourself to a baseball career. The players, when I was a fan, they played in the hot sun, not at night like these guys do. They traveled by train, not by plane, you know. I, well, it was, you know, in those days, uh, they, they went by train. And, uh, you know, they, they played every single day and didn't complain. If they did, they kept it to themselves. It wouldn't have done them any good anyway. <laughs>